Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. I'm here in the Barker Gallery of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art with my guest today, John Weber, the new executive director of the JSMA. He began work on October 1st, 2019. Prior to coming to the University of Oregon, Weber was the founding director of the Institute of the Arts and Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. He served as the Dayton director of the Francis Tang Teaching Museum and Art Gallery at Skidmore College from 2004 to 2012. Weber was the Leanne and George Roberts Curator of Education and Public Programs at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art from 1993 to 2004. Thanks, John, for coming on the show. Thank you. And great welcome, to be here. welcome to the University of Oregon. It's great to be at the U of O. So you have significant ties to Oregon, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and your career trajectory? Well, I grew up in Corvallis. My mother had grown up in Corvallis. My father grew up in Portland. And we actually had family that were in Brownsville. And a great-grandfather ran a, a harness shop there in the early 20th century. So got a, got a lot of Oregon in my background. Um, graduated from Crescent Valley High School. Was, uh, then was, uh, went to Reed College after that. And then worked for a couple of years in Oregon and then was in grad school in Southern California, University of California, San Diego. Then came back to Portland in the 80s to teach at a small design school there, Oregon School of Design of Architecture. I was teaching art history, but my, my degrees are in studio art and I was also teaching some evening classes at the um, museum art school uh, at the time and PNCA and um, ended up as a curator of contemporary art at the Portland Art Museum and got to know the art community there, was working as an artist, was one of the founders, co-founders of Nine Gallery as a photographer, working with photo text and other kinds of imagery. So um, Oregon is really where I, I started my career and it's great coming back. I still know a lot of the artists from that era. There's a lot of younger artists, of course, and there's still a, really a thriving art scene um, in the state and it's really fascinating coming back and seeing what people have been doing in the 26 years I was away. <laughs> so you, you mentioned that one of the parts of your early career was that you were an artist. And this is not a typical thing for curators or directors to have been. So my first question is, how, how has your experience as an artist influenced your work as a curator? Well, I, that's a great question. And I got involved in curating through um, writing about art, was writing for a small art critical review in Portland, and was re really interested in what other artists were doing. Even in grad school, I enjoyed going into studios and asking people about their process. Why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? What were you thinking about? Were you looking at so-and-so? Um, and that's something I still enjoy a tremendous amount. And I started out really so as, on the one hand, I, w I was a maker. I liked making things, I liked making art. And then that gravitated into you know, writing about other people's art and then actually making exhibitions. And so early in, in my career, it was just really fun to get to know often an older artist, um, sometimes contemporaries, and talk to them about what they were doing and then how to put it in a gallery. You know, you're, you're making a show. And over time, that expanded in some ways and to making a whole, a whole program, to making programs when I went into education at SF MoMA, I was still on the curatorial staff, which was rare for an education curator to still be actively making exhibitions, but that was part of that position. Um, and at a certain point, I, the, the scale just expanded and I wanted to um, make bigger programs and then help make uh, museums and shape them I also like the collaboration that's involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, I like working with other people on things. I like bouncing ideas around, thinking out loud, asking other people, well, what do you think we should do? And, and then coming up with something. A lot of the best ideas that I think I've had were actually ideas that came out of that kind of group process, hmm. which is where you get a better idea than you have alone. And it's interesting, at SF MoMA, we interviewed Robert Rauschenberg. Um, about some of the works that had come into the collection in the you know, late, would have been late 20th century, um, early aughts, I can't remember exactly. Anyway, he was talking about a piece he did called the John Cage Tire Print, where he works with Cage and he, he paints the, the tire and then they, he's laying down sheets of paper and they're, they're driving over to make this long print. 
and we asked him about collaboration. And he was saying if you're, you know, if you're working alone, then you've only got your ideas. And if, you, if you're collaborating with other people, then you've got other people's ideas too. And it's just more. And I've, I found that to be the case. And I think that's one piece of the artist piece. The other part is, I think as a director and curator, maybe I'm comfortable taking chances and not knowing what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know what's going to happen when you make, of art, make a work of art. You go into the studio, you go to a site for a site-specific work, and the thing you're making talks to you and tells you what might work and what might not work, and it evolves. And so I'm very comfortable with that, you know, within, within reason, with that process of not knowing and walking out on limbs and figuring out if it starts to break, we'll just jump to the next limb. <laughs> but also knowing that you, can't, you can only jump so far. So it's not about taking crazy chances, but it is about trusting that process and working with a good artist who you know wants to make a good piece and then figuring out what, and a good show and figuring out how to do that together. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your work at SFMOMA, a little more about that. So you were the curator of education and public programming pro programs, and you've said it's somewhat unusual for someone to be on the curatorial side and on the education side as well. Mm -hmm. So tell us, you, you started to say a little bit about that. What are some of the things you did in the education side there that were interesting or unique? Mm -hmm. We, well, the... We went from a very small department of about five in the old building, the Civic Center Veterans Administration building, to the new building, um, what's now the old new building, because they've expanded again, that opened in 1995 uh, south of Market. And the education department went from about five to about 16 people. The biggest thing we did was we added a whole new area in interactive educational technologies. Mm -hmm. And we added the first curatorial position in that area, and that was actually, uh, Peter Samus was his name, and he was actually sitting, as was I, on the curatorial team of the museum, you know, with the painting and sculpture curator, the photography curator, and those, and thinking about what we were gonna do as an institution, and then how our digital programming could, could contribute to that. We did a lot of work interviewing artists. Um, the Rauschenberg interview was one of those. You know, Richard Serra, uh, Martha Rossler, um, a, lot, a lot of that, and trying to bring the artist's voice directly to the public. Mm -hmm. We also did a lot of archival work, um, scanning documents, earlier going back at old reviews. Um, I did one giant section, or very significant section, on Jackson Pollock, because we had Jackson Pollock's Guardians of the Secret. Mm -hmm. And so, for all of that, we'd go back through the kind of the, the shoebox of the archive, all the stuff that's there that scholars look at and that curators look at. The public never gets to see. And our idea was show the public those things too. Mm -hmm. So that they can, they can see that and also tell the stories that curators tell when they're walking through the show with a colleague or with a collector or on a public tour, but that doesn't usually end up on the label, mm -hmm. you know, the extended label. Tell people all of that stuff and, and make it as, as lively as possible and make it nonlinear so you can go in. It's like eating potato chips. You like, bet you can't eat just one and like click here and click there and get another one. Really, well, that was interesting. Let's see another one. I mean, we had video of Frida Kahlo. You know, we had, um, who's a huge hero when we did a Frida Kahlo show. Um, we did a big section on Eva Hesse when we did the Eva Hesse website, and we talked to her collaborators and talked about the evolution of the work over time, its physical evolution, going from very shiny chain polymer cast sculptures to these things that look like dead skin. What's that about? And that was um, a really a, a big new area that that museum was getting involved in and um, pioneering how you could use the capacities of the computer, and then eventually the internet. Because when we started that, you couldn't put video on the internet. Mm -hmm. So we were publishing CD-ROMs with video. And then eventually the internet caught up. But um, that was really exciting. All the work we did bringing artists to speak and symposia, we worked with TJ Clark on a major symposium um, about the, the ideas that he's engaged the end of modernism in painting and critiques of, of uh, look, looking at the social history of art. That was very exciting. And I also liked the work that we did. We did a lot of work with schools, mm -hmm. with teachers, 
um, bringing um, youth into the museum. And actually, we work closely with Kamala Harris on a youth mentoring program called MoMA Matches. Mm -hmm. She was a young trustee of the museum at the time mm -hmm. and was very, um, very engaged in getting high school kids to come in particularly um, kids of color, and coming into the museum and seeing the museum as someplace that they could own too. Mm. And so she recruited young professionals, very diverse, to work with the kids, walk through, and um, my department set up and helped arrange all of those matches. And Kamala herself was very involved in, you know, this person should talk to this student, and she would be going through these stacks of information we'd collected. And so that was pretty exciting. Wow, that's cool. So yeah. the next step in your career is you become the Dayton director of the Francis Tang Teaching Museum uh, at Skidmore College. And its name indicates that it's a teaching museum. In fact, it's like the first academic museum to use the title, a teaching museum. Mm -hmm. So what is a teaching museum and why are teaching museums important? Why is that a good thing? That was, that was an intriguing thing. I'd seen a review of a show they did um, in the New York Times of a video by Nayland Blake and said Tang Teaching Museum. I was going, well, that's an interesting name and I'm the head of education here, so what do they mean by that? And I really didn't know at the time because the terminology, which is now very established in the academic museum world, was at that point new. You know, are they teaching art history? Are they teaching museology? What exactly are they teaching? So I started to kind of follow them and this would have been around 2002. They'd open in 2000. And then in in um, 2004, I got a phone call from an assistant um, dean there saying, we're, we're hunting for a director for this museum. I don't know if you've heard of us. It's like, yeah, I've heard of you. <laughs> Nayland was an old friend. We'd shown him in, um, in, in Portland in a show. And so it had kind of come up. And it turns out what they mean by that and what interests me about that is you mean just teaching the way the university thinks about teaching. You mean teaching across the disciplines, working with faculty, um, based in art, but often, in the Tang's case, showing material that was not art, and understanding, though, that art is fundamentally interdisciplinary, that it engages with the world, that artists engage with the world, and that you can be working with faculty in any area. You know, here we're in front of the Ralph Steadman show, and we're actually in front of some works that are looking at the, the sixth extinction, as it's called, the die-off of animals. These are animals that are, that are endangered or gone, and so um, Stedman, he's British, he is um, an, an illustrator, he's a cartoonist, he's an artist. And here he's looking at what's happening to our planet globally. This is a great work to have at University of Oregon because we have environmental studies people in all areas of the curriculum. And this is what a teaching museum does, is it, it works with art, with faculty, in order to reach students and also directly with students to talk about the, the issues of our time, the issues that are being studied in the classroom, and the things that are really gonna shape the, the, the future of not just the human race, but, but life on our planet as we know it. Now some of the issues are smaller than that, and there's also room for beauty, and there's also room for poetry, and there's room for quieter topics, but you can use art to get to anywhere, and you can use the best art to get to anywhere. Um, I see no conflict between art that has social, political, subject matter, meaning, and form as we know it. I, I don't think there's a distinction there. Art, and art has always dealt with crit critical issues, um, you know, whether, whatever they are, and you see that in all cultures. So to me, a teaching museum is about engaging that in collaboration with faculty to impact teaching, learning, and research um, in higher ed. And it's something I find tremendously exciting. And we work with general public. We have people from off campus too. Our students can work with them. That also builds into it. So I know uh, in the position you held after the Tang, which was the founding director of the Institute of the Arts and Sciences at UC Santa Cruz, that you did some really interesting collaborations on the research faculty side. You mm -hmm. wanna tell us about some of the shows mm -hmm. that you did there, some of the work yeah. you did there? Well, the, um, the biggest project we did there was with uh, ecological artists, uh, Newton and Helen Harrison. And Helen passed away, but um, they had been working together since the late 60s and early 70s. Really, they're foundational artists in um, ecological art. Now we'd think of um, environmental studies, environmental art. and. 
I had known Newton and Helen since grad school because they'd been at San Diego and then they came as emeritus professors teaching in um, one of the MFA programs there in, in Santa Cruz. And uh, their work is, it really thinks at huge scale about climate change and how humans can, can work proactively to mitigate the, the disaster that we've created. And so we worked with them on a, what's really a science art uh, research project where we were in collaboration with one of the, um, one of the uh, environmental botanists at the university. And it was uh, three geodesic domes that were in the Arboretum, and they'd been around since the 70s and fallen into disrepair. And we renovated them with a new, new um, sort of roofs from a firm in Ashland um, that does um, geodesic domes. And um, each one is a greenhouse that looks at the impact, different impacts of possible climate change scenarios on plant um, ecosystems in the area. Most of the plants are native, but we weren't holding a strict line on that. We were looking like, what are the plants that are here? We know it's gonna get hotter, but we don't know what the, the rain system is gonna, situation is going to be. So one of the domes is going to be kept at an always wetter than normal cycle. Like a few years back, it rained 51 inches, and that was following some years where we had drought for five years, around five inches of rain, so we could get that. Another one is a drought scenario, um, same plants in each one, and then the third one is wildly erratic. And then outside, it's all landscaped, this is quite a large area, it's all landscaped with the same plants so we can see what they're doing in the current scenario where it's not as warm, it's always gonna be warmer inside the domes than it is outside because they collect heat, and the, the main issue is to not have them fry the plants, so there's, there's a, a way to, to do that. So this is a, a, a project that involved collaboration with artists, talking with faculty uh, about, you know, is our case sample going to be big enough? Are we going to learn anything here? And the answer was, yeah, you know, it'd be great to have a bigger sample size, but you'll learn something. It's worth doing. And um, Newton would like the project to go, go for 50 years. So that's a long time. We, we <laughs> and, but he also knows that you need to do it, you need to do it at least for three to five years to find out anything. And we were thinking, okay, so let's say 10 to 50 and see what happens. And we'll be working with his son, um, Joshua, and the, the, they have something called the Center for the Study of the Force Majeure, which looks at huge climate impact stuff and what artists can do with scientists to envision how you might, how you might respond to it. This, the site there is in the dead center of the Arboretum, and it also allows, of course, the Arboretum um, staff and the students working with them to tell the story of, well, what does climate change mean? We hear about it all the time, but it means a lot of things. If, you're, if, you're, if your plant ecology changes, that's gonna change the insects that are in the area, that's gonna change water retention in the soil, and both of those are gonna change the animals that can live there, so there's this cascading effect of, of things. It's not just that we'll have some different plants, it's that a lot of other things can happen, and it's really unpredictable, and we just frankly don't know. And so this piece, which is called um, Future Garden for the Central Coast of California, one of a series of future gardens that they've been making around the world, this is a way to, to tell that story locally and then to, to broadcast that. So can you tell us about any uh, future exhibits that you're fantasizing about, dreaming of? Um, well, these are things that may happen or may not happen, but um, one of the things I would love to do, there's a piece by Canadian artist Janet Cardiff called the 40 part motet. And it is a sound, a 40 channel sound installation of a 16th century polyphonic choral piece by Thomas Tallis, the most important British uh, polyphonic choral composer of, of, of that period. And it's just a glorious work. And it'd be really exciting to collaborate with people in, in music and in town, and possibly if we could do a, a festival of, of, of uh, polyphonic choral music, it would be really cool. There's a lot of contemporary choral music that is, um, is glorious, and uh, Janet Cardiff is an amazing artist. She and her husband, George Bruce Miller, normally work together. He worked on this, but he's not a named author because the idea was really hers. And we had done an installation with them at Santa Cruz in a redwood forest that was a, a 22 channel audio installation called Forest for a Thousand Years. And it was a, just a transcendently beautiful work. 
And the 40 part motet has been shown for a number of years. It's in collections, MoMA, New York, for example. It's also in a collection in California, and I have talked a little bit with the collectors there about mm. the possibility of bringing it. Um, I would love to do a long-term collaboration that could take two or three years with faculty in environmental studies to think about how we might work together to talk about that. Mm. And how do you talk about the future of the earth in a way that doesn't simply discourage people? How do you talk about um, what we need to do and opportunities for hope and the kind of work that needs to go on, the fact that climate change is not going to be felt by everybody in the same way. There's is issues of social justice there that are very, very important and economics and, and technology and you name it. Um, so that would be a really meaningful project to do. And something like that, you're not trying to present conclusions as much as you're trying to present really good questions and see where they go. And faculty in, one, in any area can take it where they need to go with their students. But by seeing work in the museum from other areas that reflect other domains of inquiry and concern, then that maybe expands even more the kind of work that they might do. So that's a, a big long-term project. And then there, the last thing I'd mention is there is a, a new piece by the um, uh, artist Isaac Julian on uh, Frederick Douglass, the great black 19th century abolitionist. Mm -hmm. And it's a look at, at uh, it's a video installation that's a look at Frederick Douglass. It's a 10 channel, really big, sumptuous. Isaac's work is, is super elegant and beautiful. And I'm very interested in that. And it, the possibility that we could bring um, some of the 19th century photographs of, of, of Douglass. He was apparently the most photographed man of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And so to have those archival photographs, you know, in, as we're thinking about um, race relations in this country and the issues that have come up uh, over the past um, three years of our current presidency, it would be really a really meaningful show to have here. Hmm. That's very interesting. Um, are there any particular challenges that you've discovered the JSMA is facing? Well, I think higher ed, anyone who's been following higher ed knows that public research universities are, are facing a, a challenge that relates to the funding structures and the cost of everything now. Um, it's just education is, is more expensive. Healthcare is more expensive. We have um, different needs that our students have now than existed 20, 30, 40 years ago. And as an academic, academic institution, we, you know, we have some of the same challenges. Uh, about half of our budget comes directly from the university. So as it receives, uh, as it deals with these challenges, um, so do we. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, I think we have a lot of support here and we have a great history of good work and many people in the community that recognize the importance of that. So I think we have a lot to build on, mm -hmm. but um, keeping, keeping museums alive is always a challenge and academic museum, and it's no different than that anywhere else. But the, the, the resources here, and I hear I mean also the intellectual resources, the idea resources of the university are vast. Hmm. So um, besides your connection to Oregon, what attracted you to the JSMA? Why did you want to come here? Well, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it has a, a, a strong staff, a, a great, one of the wonderful things that Jill Hartz and the staff did over the last decade was to build up the relationship with the faculty in the university. Um, we have faculty from all across the university who are working with us, bringing in students from all across the university. We have community programs that are engaging with, in, particularly in, in health areas, engaging with hospitals and with people out in the community. We have schools that are coming and teachers that are coming. We have everything you want to have. If, if, you're, um, if you're interested in this kind of thing. I, I love being in the, the teaching and learning environment. I taught when I was at SF MoMA. I taught in Oregon um, at the Tang. I was teaching regularly there and was teaching actually an MFA exhibition course when I was at UC Santa Cruz. So it's great coming here, uh, looking at the, what's going on in the studio arts, um, in art history, as I mentioned, in envir environmental studies, in um, ethnic studies. We're bringing Carrie Mae Weems here 
to do a show. She's an Oregon artist, um, African American, tremendously respected. Uh, got a MacArthur in 2013. We were actually in grad school together, so it's exciting to, to reunite again. We've been in touch over the years, but, but that's great. So there's just, there's a lot going on here that's exciting, and we've got all the tools to work with it at this museum. Um, I have this history in Oregon. Uh, my parents are still in Corvallis, so it's a combination of professional and personal slash career things that are, that are just, just perfect for me. So uh, we have like a minute left. This is my last question. Um, I know, and you just mentioned it, that m many places along the line you've taught. Mm -hmm. Do you think you're going to do any teaching while you're at the University of Oregon? Um, I'd love to. I'd love to. I don't know exactly when it'll make sense to start, but as part of negotiating with the university, I said I want to be able to teach in some way, shape, or form. And we can figure it out down the line, but I just I like being in the classroom with, a, with an engaged, good group of students, particularly when you can really work together and see what they're doing. Um, I have them give them a challenge and have them do something. No, I, I really enjoy that. There's nothing like coming out of a class that went really well. And there's nothing worse than coming out of a class that didn't gel the way you hoped it would. On the one, you're, you're just high as a kite. It's like, that worked. And the other one, it's like, I got to figure out a way to make this work. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, John. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Welcome to the University of Oregon. Welcome to the JSMA. We're really lucky to have you. Thanks, Paul. I'm lucky to be here. I've been speaking with John Weber, the new executive director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. He began work on October 1st, 2019. Thanks everyone for watching.